Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. The Survival of the Wisest by Jonas Salk Chapter 10 To Distinguish the Wholesome from the Sick It would be very pleasant, indeed, if it were unnecessary to occupy ourselves with the pathological and the destructive, and to be concerned only with the healthy and the constructive, but that would be as unrealistic as trying to see life in general, and human life in particular, only from an optimistic point of view. If we are to recognise and to choose those alternatives, or options, with value for survival and evolution, it will be necessary to recognise and to distinguish between the wholesome and the sick, as seen from a developmental and evolutionary point of view. There is a high degree of dynamic relativity in living nature, and what may be regarded as healthy under one set of circumstances may be unhealthy under another. Since the laws of nature have a bearing on human survival and fulfilment, we must try to recognise the tendencies that operate against the development of a dynamic equilibrium. If man were as wise as nature in respect to evolutionary survival, he might then be able to act accordingly to such tendencies in himself. This would imply knowledge and wisdom not only of outer nature, of which he is a part, but of his inner nature. It appears as if individually and collectively man possesses responsibility and accountability for the choices he makes affecting his own life, his species, and life in general on this planet. If exercised wisely, such responsibility would ensure the prolongation of his own presence as an individual and as a species, under circumstances maximising human satisfaction and fulfilment. He has exhibited his power to counter disease, and to some extent death as well. He has also shown his power to create unhealthy conditions on a vast scale and to bring about death generally as well as selectively. Now, however, it is within his reach to alter the shape of his curve of growth and the existence of a great many living systems, including his own. As he extends his influence, trying, for example, to alter the growth of cancerous tissue, and even to control his fertility, will he, as he learns with even greater refinement to control death and birth, use this power wisely for advancing physiological health and economic well-being, and for reducing disease and suffering in the psychosocial realm. Such power could as well result, however, in diminished satisfaction and fulfilment and in an increase rather than in a reduction in suffering, causing the development of a more intolerable state for the human being and the body that houses it. Since adversity for the individual is, in fact, part of the evolutionary process, which, by definition, implies dealing with adversity and is, therefore, essential for its maintenance, it will be important to compensate constructively for eliminating the difficulties of life which man is designed to overcome. Such needs are more often seen retrospectively than in advance. Thus there are both danger and reward to be mindful of in the steps man takes towards improving his condition. Having referred to duality in nature generally, using as an example the coexistence of life and death, as well as of health and disease, it should be clear that man exists in a state of balance between life and death, between health and disease. He is called upon constantly to maintain equilibrium and to increase the margin, so as to remain in the zone of health, and as far from death as possible for as long as he can. 
he is free to use, in many other ways, the knowledge and wisdom he has acquired in the course of doing so. He may do so to improve the quality of life, as well as to reduce the incidence of disease. So far as man is concerned, it would seem, therefore, that the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom constitutes a purpose that could be of evolutionary value, and therefore might be expected to be looked upon with favour by nature. If we are correct in assuming that its game is to maintain life and the process of evolution for as long as they can be sustained, man seems to be the most actively evolving living organism, and nature's interest in him might be thought to be equivalent to his own. If man fails to judge and act wisely in maintaining his life and the process of evolution, nature can be expected to take an active hand in correcting his errors. Accordingly, man must try to know as much as possible about nature's way of error-correcting through mechanisms of regulation and control, both for augmenting health and reducing disease, if he is to develop a niche in which he can also experience the greatest number of healthy, constructive, creative individuals. This implies a need to determine how to best deal with the problem posed by nature's tendency to eliminate the unfit, or those who do not fit well, which differs from man's tendency to try to preserve human life regardless of fitness. It is unrealistic to believe that some utopian human state could exist free from the operation of the laws of nature, that man can operate, collectively or individually, according to rules that defy or are counter to the laws of nature, is equally unreal. Similarly, man's attempt to defy or oppose his being leads only to the kind of distress from which there is absolutely no escape, save an illusory one, that may be temporarily provided by diversion, through devotion or addiction, to not altogether satisfying purposes in life, of the energy that is intended, in part, for fulfilling the processes of life. Such escape is unnecessary if the purposes of life and the purposes chosen in one's life match the desires of being. Since man's being desires not only to fulfil the species' purpose of survival and nature's purpose in evolution, but to satisfy the individual, then man's chosen purposes in life must in some way relate to each if the individual's being is to be fulfilled. The contrasts coming into evidence in the transition from Epoch A to Epoch B show that there must exist in the germ plasm of man, and hence in the human being, broadly speaking, desires to satisfy nature, the species, and the individual's being, as well as a need to react aggressively against forces judged to be of opposite value. If so, it is of great practical as well as theoretical interest to understand the different tendencies now emerging as man demonstrates his fitness for survival, as a species, comprised of diverse individuals and of groups. This requires a new set of human attributes different from those selected in the early history of man. If man were wise, he would try to understand and cooperate with the inevitability of these changes to which he can actively contribute as a fulfilling purpose in life as well as of life. It is likely that the cost in human life of such changes will be considerable. The cost can be reduced, however, if man will act with, not counter to, nature. Hence, he must understand nature, so that he may cooperate with it to his advantage. The net effect might be not only a considerable reduction in conflict, but an augmentation in productive and constructive work, as well as in purpose, essentially for a healthy, fulfilling human existence. This requires the kind of discipline seen in nature, except at moments when life is near its end due to disease or age. Such discipline has to be adduced and encouraged. The existing potential for it is realised only if challenged. 
This implies a need for the development of an ego structure, for education and for training appropriate to fulfilling the potential of the being and its disciplined and restrained expression. Man must learn to discriminate between the qualities of things if he is to distinguish the pathological from the healthy, and if he is to improve the quality of his own life and of the lives of those to come. He must recognize the existence, among his numbers, of the destructive. Eventually, too, he must understand the causes, cures, and means for prevention of the physical or mental disturbances of human beings who, if impaired, can exert a great force for destruction. Having set forth these views about health and disease, we now have to elaborate on what may be referred to as the ego system in relation to the being system, and on relationships generally in the human realm, as these are revealed in the epochal changes through which man is going.